I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, January 8th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Justin Gordon. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to thank Mr. Gordon. He is a senior from Milford Mill Academy. The next item is consideration of the agenda. Are there any addition or changes to tonight's agenda, Ms. White? There are no changes or additions. Mr. Hayden? to a, a uh, uh, to the public as soon as possible. There's a motion, is there a second? Uh, Mr. Offerman, second. Is there a discussion? Mr. Kuhn? <coughs> I, would, I would like to say, Roger, I, um, I fully agree that we need to get that information out to the public as soon as possible. As the new, newly appointed chair of the audit committee, the concern that I have is, um, and you wouldn't be privy to this, but the uh, auditor has not provided even a draft report to be reviewed internally and or by the committee. So I think it's premature <laughs> to try and put this on the agenda for the 22nd when the audit committee hasn't been able to see it and the draft isn't even complete and has not been provided to the school system. So I, I, I do share your, um, your um, concern and wanting to get it uh, out there as soon as possible, but I, I thought I would share that so that perhaps you would reconsider your motion. Mr. Hayden. Um, I believe that we could move forward on this motion and if somehow the audit committee could tell us uh, or the auditor could tell us, I should say more precisely than the audit committee, that it's not enough time, we could always say we can't do that. But at least we're saying it's important, the public knows it's important, it's something that really wraps around all the concern we've had over the past couple of years and to start on it now, rather than putting it down the road again, I think is very important. And therefore, if we pass this motion, the next conversation gets to be with the auditor to say, to get your horses in gear and, and let's get this done. Uh, auditors are people too, they work at different speeds. So you get to be able to say, we need this, we need it quickly. And this has brought nothing but consternation to this board and this school system for several years now. And I think it's time to say, let's bring it to a conclusion. Ms. Rowe. So I would prefer not to add things to the agenda in order to rush our vendors in their work. When audits take time, and there's details to be gone through. And if they're in the process of going through these details, I don't think it's prudent to get the best, most thorough result from the auditor if we're putting it on the agenda simply to rush their work. And I, I think allowing the audit committee time to consider these things and do this according to the committee structure that we're forming makes 
more sense. I'm just not sure of the prudence of putting this on the next meeting's agenda. Thank you. Ms. Jose. I believe we got an email from the auditor that they are ready to present on the 22nd. What Roger is saying is that it's, it's important that he presents, he or she presents on the 22nd and the entire board gets to hear that along with the public. Uh, Ms. Hen and then Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. So I agree with Mr. Kuhn's um, comments with allowing the audit committee to do its work and seeing as they have not even received yet a draft of the audit report, it doesn't feel like they're prepared to present to us on the 22nd. Um, I agree with Mr. Hayden that we, we want to be expedient in this work. I've been as anxious as he has with waiting to see the full report of the audit, but the audit committee may have questions. They have not reviewed the scope of work. They have not seen a draft of the report. They have not had access to the auditors to even ask a question yet. So I would not support this motion. I think the audit committee needs to be allowed time to do its work. I have every confidence that they will work expediently to bring the um, audit firm back to the board as soon as possible to present the findings. Mr. Kuhn. Um, I think I think we all want the same thing here. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Uh, Josie pointed out that there there was an email from our auditors that said that they are prepared to present on the 22nd, uh, which I immediately re replied back to them and the lead person at the internal audit group within the system to say, how is it that in, in the audit plan that's been provided under the reporting section that says that they're gonna provide us with a draft, have we not received anything yet they're saying they're prepared to brief the entire board with their final product on the 22nd? It doesn't make any sense and it's premature and um, I think this will be worked out fairly soon. Uh, we have meetings set up uh, on the 16th for the audit committee, the 18th to actually meet directly with the auditor uh, for the first time. Um, and then the 22nd is a few days later. So, um, you know, the board will vote as it wishes, but I wanna lay all the facts out for everyone to understand the timing of this and the fact that I find it, um, uh, I find that it doesn't make sense to try and say, um, uh, let's provide this product to the entire board when a draft hasn't even been provided to, to anyone at this point. Thank you, any other comments, Mr. Hayden? I think to uh, kick the can down the road again at this point in time is uh, ludicrous. And to say that there's not enough time really indicates a lack of knowledge of what audits are about. They're going to bring an audit product to the board. It doesn't mean that it's a final thing that the board necessarily would vote on and say, bless you, we're going to move forward with this, but rather this is something that we at least would have something to work with and move forward on. Rather than talk about, have a committee that's not been involved before in this and come up with no answer for who knows how long. We've had enough of this. It's time to move forward. And we can do this. I, I, in my checkered past, I have I've worked on audits, I've received audits, I've been down the road in any number of different areas. This is inconceivable that we would think that we couldn't get this done in this period of time. This is not rocket science. It's get the job done and move forward. It's too important to wait on. Are there any other comments? Okay, I'll call for the vote. Uh, all of those in favor of Mr. Hayden's motion, please raise your hand. All those opposed? The motion fails. Um, thank you for that discussion, and um, we do look forward to hearing from the audit committee um, at the next time the board meeting does have its updates from committee meetings. Um, 
Moving along. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. <clears throat> the next item of, on the agenda is D, selection of speakers. And earlier this evening, sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public comment portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who signed up will be permitted to speak. So if we could have the names, please. Thank you. Our first speaker is Elise De Cruz. Our second speaker is Sharon Saroff. Our third speaker is Melissa Powell. Fourth is Rebecca Gorman. Fifth is Diana Bergman. Sixth is Aranita Crawford. Seventh is Latisse Jones. Eighth is Dr. Crystal Francis. Ninth is Gigi Aya Robertson. And our last speaker is Delegate Charles Sidnor. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receives the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. Is there a... Okay. Okay, certainly. So one of those names, oh, delegates, uh, Sidnor is being uh, put onto the stakeholder group, so we're going to pull another name for public comment. So our 10th speaker for public comment is Justin Gordon. Okay, great, thank you. So the, member of the members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the interim superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. Uh, I do want to say that we are going to institute just a new procedure this evening. If there are any documents that need to be presented uh, to the board, if they could please be given to the staff member that will be uh, over at that desk, then the staff member will make sure they're distributed to the board. So I will now call our advisory groups to speak. And first we have Delegate Charles Sidnor. Good evening. Good evening, board. Uh, I am here uh, this evening. Uh, uh, oh, let me, let me, for a number of you, uh, you've never met me. I'm Delegate Charles Sitton. I represent District 44B, uh, which is on the southwest side of Baltimore County. Uh, I've 
used to come here as a parent all the time. I had my uh, children who attended uh, uh, Imagine Discovery. I have three girls who are in the system currently. One attends Woodbridge Elementary, uh, one attends Sudbrook, and my eldest attends uh, Carver. The reason that I'm here tonight, uh, when in fact I was supposed to be at Woodbridge being the uh, uh, pronouncer at its spelling bee, I thought it was important enough because of a number of emails that I had been receiving from constituents concerned uh, with uh, the treatment of Ms. Uh, Halima Decoye. And um, while I understand that it is uh, the chair's prerogative to appoint members to whichever committees that, they, uh, that, that the chair desires, uh, to me, one of the things that's very important is encouraging young students who are interested in leadership positions to make certain uh, that they have those opportunities. One of the things that I do with a number of our students in my district, we invite them down to Annapolis each year so they can see how the process works down in Annapolis and we give them some peace and they get to have a little chat and chew with their delegate. Ms. Salima, while I have never met her personally, we have communicated via, uh, what is it, Twitter? <laughs> and looking at what this young lady does, it's, it's amazing to me. I'm truly inspired by her work. And when she was removed from the Policy and Curriculum Committee, it, it caused a bit of an uproar in, in my district. Uh, so I, again, I thought it was important to come here tonight and I understand uh, that uh, she's been placed back on the policy and curriculum committee, so I, I appreciate that. But again, I, I just wanted to make certain uh, that she knew, as in looking out seeing me and, and her Milford family, uh, that, that she has her community support. Thank you. Thank you. And next, from TABCO, we have Ms. Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey and Vice Chairwoman Hanna, Ms. White, and members of the board. First of all, Happy New Year. We are looking forward to working with all of you and to continue the work toward improvement of our schools and for our children. And I would like to thank many of you who attended our legislative breakfast this past Saturday and, and the remarks that you brought, uh, Ms. Causey. Thank you for that. And I'm sure you were able to have many impactful conversations with the teachers and support staff while you were there. Uh, hopefully it opened your eyes to some of the things going on. Being able to meet in a setting over breakfast and away from the workplace helps foster these important conversations. I also hope that some of you signed up to join us on our As We March in Annapolis on March 11th. And I have a sign-up form in case you haven't. And for the audience out there, anybody who wants to support public education can sign up, come on the bus, and come down on March 11th. So we, I have some people here who have sign-ups with them, and they will take them around to anybody who wants to sign up to come with us. We appreciate the open lines of communication we have shared with the superintendent and many other BCPS officials. We continue to work in a collaborative manner with the school system, and we look forward to building our capacity to work through various, various issues in even more collaborative process. You have before you tonight the first draft of the FY 2020 school budget. Ms. White has stated in the past, and this year included, would be, that she would be pressing for more positions for our, our teachers and our support staff. But it is imperative that we press for these positions to help the, address the needs of our students. So once this board decides what they want in that budget, I hope that you're going to help us go and fight for that at the county level. Our teachers need decreased class sizes to allow the time necessary to individualize their instruction, and they need tools readily available to help as they plan their instruction. So um, we look forward to seeing the budget and hearing about it and uh, moving forward for the betterment of our students. Thank you. Thank you. 
Next, we have Ms. Jane Lee, President of PTA Council of Baltimore County. Good evening. Good evening. Happy New Year. Maybe a new year, but for us, it's the middle of the year. And I actually come tonight to just brag about some of the things that we've got going on. We are going to be holding a general meeting on January 31st at Lock Raven High School where we will be concentrating on health and safety. Anything from opioids to bullying to childhood hunger to screen time, teen driving, school start time, water, adequate buildings and transportation and anything else our membership decides to bring forward that night. We will be networking and we will have speakers. On February 7th, we will be joining the rest of the councils and membership of Maryland PTA in Annapolis for PTA Night in Annapolis, and we are encouraging all of our membership to go. We are canceling our council board meeting for that purpose. Uh, March 12th through 14th, we will be in D.C. because we will be making a Hill visit and attending the National PTA Legislative Conference. We have just completed receiving all the entries to our annual reflections contest, which is one of our best programs. It builds self-esteem in students, and we look forward to our reception, and of course, we'll send you all invitations. And we are coming into the time of the year where our PTAs are establishing their nominating committees and we'll be soon holding elections with a couple of PTAs, new PTAs that are forming, and I'm excited about that. And lastly, all the emails that I always come, those of you who know me know I usually come and talk about all the emails I get. The most common question of recent days has been what's happening with the superintendent search committee. So I have sent a message to Ms. Hen and I would like to make it official that we would like, if possible, to invite someone to come and discuss the process, the timeline, and the possible community input part of that. Nothing about candidates for the position. Strictly qualities, traits, talents, educational background, initiatives and ideas for the future and input from, you know, that we can put forward. Nothing other than that. Um, but I stress there will be no discussions of candidates or people involved. I won't allow that in my meeting. So other than that, we look forward to working with you. And I thank you for giving me the time to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tom DeHart, the Executive Director of CASE. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. So as most of you continue that steep learning curve of your new position, I would like to speak with you tonight uh, about the Peer Assistance and Review Program, known as PAR. PAR is a program that is co-sponsored by the system, TABCO, and CASE, and it's designed to improve teacher quality, increase teacher retention, and increase student achievement. Support is given to teachers new to BCPS who have no prior teaching experience, this includes an ever-increasing number of non-certified teachers. Others may be included as well. Consulting teachers, or CTs, provide individualized support to client teachers with a focus on the four domains of professional practice. Throughout the year, CTs and their client teachers collaborate to establish goals for professional growth, which is documented in a number of ways. CTs provide informal and structured feedback uh, in order to facilitate reflection and growth. CTs complete and submit a mid-year and final summative report to the PAR panel with a recommendation of proficient, developing proficiency, or not proficient. And that PAR panel consists of principals and partner teachers. Copies of the signed reports are shared with the teacher, their principal, and the PAR panel. In the most recent survey of client teachers given last spring, 98% of the respondents agreed that, quote, the goals they set with their CTs were aligned with data and improved their teaching practice. The PAR program is in its fifth year of implementation here in our county, and the results have been extremely positive. 
If we want to retain new teachers and improve their effectiveness, this program is essential. With the increasing number of new teachers, probationary teachers, and career changers with no education experience, the need for CTs has grown. Additional CT positions have been included in the budget that you received tonight. Both CASE and TABCO request that you approve those positions. BCPS spends a great deal of money and energy attracting and hiring teachers. And it just makes sense to do what we know works to protect that investment. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Mr. Clifford Collins from the Northwest um, Area Education Advisory Council. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hinn, and Ms. White. I am Clifford Collins, Chair of the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. In my statement at your December 18th meeting, you may recall I said it's a new day in the Northwest area. To that end, the Northwest Education Advisory Council will be paying closer attention to the work of the school board and working closer with it than we have admittedly done in the past. I also urge the new board to again refrain from adopting policies and making decisions that appear to be or are a conflict of interest or self-serving. Self Recent actions tell me that you did not listen to me very carefully at that last meeting, or maybe you chose not to listen to me at all. I recently read a Board of Education committee listing which dis and discovered that Halima Adekoya was previously removed from the Policy Review Committee and had been recently reinstated as a member of that committee. I believe it's unconscionable for a student member of the board as a member of that committee to have to experience the trauma, anxiety, and insensitivity of a misguided decision to remove her from the board uh, committee in the first place. This matter strengthens my resolve and belief that quality control when making appointments means doing it right the first time. This board should not waste any time in apologizing to Ms. Adekoya for this terribly misguided decision. My question to you simply is, what were you thinking, Madam Chair? What was your rationale for making that decision to remove a very active, intelligent, and articulate student from this most important board committee? What message were you sending, attempting to send to the Baltimore County public school students, parents, the public, and especially the Northwest area? Ms. Adekoya deserves your utmost respect as a representative of the, in the entire student body of Baltimore County public schools. After further review of the board's committee membership and me meeting schedule, your transparency revealed that member expertise was not a priority when making committee leadership assignments. I also noticed that one board member, Molly Joes, had not been appointed to any standing committee, while some board members have received multiple committee assignments. In closing, I urge the board to demonstrate more positive, transparent leadership and accountability to all county Thank you. So now we have the opportunity for our public to come forward, and our first uh, speaker will be Elise De Cruz. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. White, and to the entire board. I'm Elise De Cruz, and I'm a representative from Milford Mill Academy. I am the computer science teacher of Ms. Halima Adekoye, as well as an advisor 
to the NAACP. So I'm here on the behalf of all the students of Milford Mill as the advisor of the Youth Council of the NAACP. I'm here to support my student, Halima Adekoye. It's important that such a wonderful student, such a gracious young lady, have an opportunity to continue to represent the entire Baltimore County public school students at large. Our students need an articul articulate young woman in the person of Ms. Adekoye, the voice to voice their interests and concerns. I'm so proud of her, and I look forward to the impact that she'll have as she continues to serve. So I thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sharon Seroff. Good evening. Happy New Year, Chair, Chairwoman Kazi and uh, Vice Chair Hen and uh, Interim Superintendent White and all of our board members. I hope that you had a calm and uh, uneventful break. Um, and now let's get back to business. Um, I sent you an email when you came back from break. Um, actually, the email was just prior to break that communication in this county is a big concern. It continues to be a big concern. Um, I have it coming up on uh, numerous occasions from my clients, from fellow parents, on social media, that if I don't have connectivity with my computer 24 seven, I can't communicate with school because they won't respond to my phone calls. They only respond to my emails. I had the opportunity recently to experience a problem with connectivity when I was sitting at an emergency room last week for the entire day, and I could receive my emails, but I couldn't respond to them. I could make phone calls, but I wasn't getting through to anybody. I was leaving messages that weren't responded to for weeks. This is a problem. If you leave a parent an email and you are a school principal and that parent doesn't have 24 seven unlimited internet, you're not communicating with that parent because that parent can't see that email. We need to recognize that there are people in the school system that do not have access to the internet. Therefore, they do not have access to Schoology. If their device isn't working properly, they do not have access to their education and their learning. If the schoolhouse's connectivity breaks down or shuts down, we don't have access. It's great that we are trying to move forward with being a technical system, but we also have to take into consideration Thank you. Our third speaker is Ms. Melissa Powell. Good evening. 
Good evening, Chairman Kazi and all of the elected and appointed school board members. Welcome to your new positions for those that are new to the board. My name is Melissa Wright Powell. I am the second vice president for the Randallstown branch of the NAACP. I am a parent, a volunteer with the Girl Scouts of Central Maryland, and I am also a, a member of a local sorority. And I'm here today because I'm concerned about the treatment that um, our gentlewoman, Miss Halima, has um, been exposed to um, with the transition of the board. I'm here because I work with children. I work with children professionally. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Family and Children's Services is my expertise. And I'm concerned about the impact of the treatment that Halima has experienced by the board. Um, we are all busy, and we all teach our children how to multitask, and I'm quite sure that she is capable. I'm concerned about the rationale she was given for being removed, and then I'm happy to hear she was reinstated. It is important when working with children that we listen to them, that we respect them, and we include them, that we do not exclude them. We are all here and being paid for because we're working with children in the Baltimore County Public Schools. So I'm very concerned about the exclusion of a child from the formation of a policy-related committee. Children should be a part of the policy making. They should be able to give input. They have all these new gadgets, group me, Twitter. They can get their data from their peers quicker than we can get data from our peers. I want to emphasize the importance that of student voice. Um, I, I was a very active PTA member for Baltimore County. My daughter received a Baltimore County PTA scholarship and is a freshman at Delaware State University. I'm a very active parent with all three organizations that I've mentioned. I want to emphasize the importance of student voice on the board, the PTA, and as active members of the school board, I think that you must always consider the voice of your student representative and not try to delegate them to or delineate them to a, a, a substandard position. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Our fourth speaker is Ms. Rebecca Gorman. No problem. Hi. My name is Rebecca Gorman, and I am privileged and blessed to serve as the SGA advisor at Milford Mill Academy. I am also an English teacher of 10th graders and seniors. I have been at Milford for the past four years, and it has become my home and my calling. I stand here before you today to plead for all the students of the West Side of the county. Um, I can't tell you how much having Halima on the board has empowered our students, a population of students who did not believe they had a voice, who I will tell you having sat in classrooms all day every day, do not believe that Baltimore County Public Schools is interested in their well-being. And I'm here today to ask you to give consideration to the students on that side, to their needs. They are unique. The challenges we face every day are complicated. They are complex, and we are doing it daily with limited resources. In class sizes pushing close to 40. Do you know what it takes to give a student one-on-one -on -one attention in a class with close to 40 students in there? My children are capable of being doctors. They are capable of being lawyers. They are capable of doing great things. A group of them sit behind you 
and they were ready to speak up for our school and for our side of the county. One of them sits next to you. And she has taught them that they have power, that they have voice, and she has refused to let them be neglected. And she has refused to let them forget that they are worth something. All children need to be worth something. And I will tell you that you have children on the west side of the county who struggle every day against incredible odds to be successful. And you owe it to them as advocates for education, as those we have elected to lead us forward into the next year to stand up for those children because if you don't show them that you care about them, then you can never expect them to care about themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Our fifth speaker is Ms. Diana Bergman. Happy New Year. <laughs> um, Ms. Adekoya, you, you should be proud, girl. You just got to, you represent so many students in Baltimore County that we have to fight 10 times as hard to make sure our voices are heard to get the much needed attention that we need. That our children have the right, all the way from Baltimore Highlands, Riverview, Lansdowne, all the way up the west side of Baltimore County. We shouldn't have to advocate this hard to get simple necessities from resources our students need. You know what, it's okay to make mistakes, that's what we tell our kids. You guys might have made a big mistake with this one. But girls smile because the whole community on the west side's got your back, okay? So I got two minutes left. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We got money to go get in Annapolis, okay? Our teachers, they need to be properly staffed. There is money. I understand the current commission wants to wait to get their act together. But there's money that the voters of Baltimore County and the whole state of Maryland voted for, for our children, these resources that we need. The Lansdowne community has been blessed that we started the first ever community pilot program in Baltimore County. And it helped a lot of families that needed those extra resources. But it needs to be duplicated throughout the rest of the county in the pockets where we have children that are being underserved and underrepresented because they cannot continue. So I'm asking every parent even our students to sign up and go on March 11 and support our teachers to get that money because our kids deserve it, each and every one of them. So I hope this school year starts off in a positive pace because if you don't pick up and stay on pace, I'm gonna come after you, okay? And let's go to Annapolis and support our teachers on March 11 and march with them. And when our kids speak, you guys have to turn those listening ears on and listen because they know what they're talking about. They are our future. So thank you. Thank you. Our sixth speaker is Aranita Crawford. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Aranita Crawford, and I am and serve the BCPS community in the capacity of magnet coordinator, educator, music department chair, and vice president of the PTSA at Milford Mill Academy. I have served in this community and at Milford Mill Academy for the past 15 years, which has been an absolute blessing for me. 
I am first and foremost a parent of two recent graduates who were number two and three in their class of the 2018 class, and also of a sophomore who is currently at Milford Mill Academy, all which have participated in magnet programs, AP classes, all of the special programs that we have, and our comprehensive programs within our school. As a magnet coordinator traveling from school to school and seeing the inequities throughout the buildings of the equipment and supplies that are given and provided from one school to the next with the programs that we have, I feel like something has to be done. It needs to be recognized. We need to address it. The funds that are provided for our schools and our programs are not being looked after properly. We have teachers that have been taken away from our programs that we need. And it seems that each time we are trying to grow our programs, more and more is being taken away. We have thriving programs, like our nursing program that has been taken away from our school and placed in another school. We have almost 11 programs, the most on our side of town, the West Zone, and we are not being supported the way that we should be. I feel like, just like the other schools, we need a brand new building as well. Stop giving us renovations. Stop remaking things. We need an absolute new building to supply and provide for our students the way that everyone else is being provided for. Thank you. Thank you. Our seventh speaker is Ms. Latisse Jones. Good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Latisse Jones, and I am a proud, esteemed member of the Milford Mill Academy staff. I also represent the stakeholder committee of a parent. I um, have a freshman who is at Milford Mill Academy in our automotive program. I have a freshman in college who graduated from our cosmetology program, and I have another daughter who is a junior at University of Louisville in chemical engineering who graduated from Western Tech. So when we represent the West Zone, we represent the West Zone well. We are absolutely a family, and I am proud to be a member of the Baltimore County Public School family, and I'm very, very proud to be a member of the Mill for Mill Academy family. So when we have a family member who is in need, our natural instinct is to go and represent that family member and to do whatever is necessary to make sure that our family member is well taken care of. In this instance, there is no difference. We want to make sure that our children are represented fully as part of this Baltimore County Public School family. We do not feel that that has happened as of yet. We are making strides in that direction, but we are asking that you continue to listen to our students. Our students come to us with a great many needs. They come to us on a daily basis as a staff, and we provide for them the best way that we can and we know how, oftentimes out of our own pockets, because we don't have the things that we need to make sure that they are adequately accompanied with what they require in order to be successful, and yet they still make excellent strides. When we have less than, we do more with it. I believe that our students deserve everything that they are entitled. That is why we are here. We are here for them. And if we cannot allow them an opportunity to come before you and to tell you what they need, as they do us every single day, we're in the trenches with them. And we do the absolute best with what we have. So we are coming to you today pleading, begging, and asking that you think about things before you make decisions that affect our babies. Because like a mama bear that I am, when one of my babies is in need, I'm coming. And I'm coming for whomever I need. As all of my Mill for Mill family is right behind me will contest to. So on behalf of all of us, I'm just asking you to continue to consider us and be sure that when we speak, you listen. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have our eighth speaker, Dr. Crystal Francis. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dr. Crystal Francis. I am 
Association, the Maryland Alliance for Justice Reform, and the Baltimore County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. One of the things that I wanted to present to the board today is a couple of ideas. Um, we know that our current curriculum does not prepare students for 21st century jobs, nor does it prepare students for college level curriculum on the university level. I am a product of Baltimore County School System. I graduated from Dundalk Middle, Sowers Point Southeastern Vocational Technical, Dundalk High, University of Maryland Eastern Shore, Towson University, and Walden University. And one of the things that, you know, a lot of students have said um, throughout my um, civic engagement workshops that I've held is that they are not engaged in the curriculum because they do not think it's going to prepare them for their career. I would like to, you to consider um, a couple of things. Industry day. Um, industry day is where we connect students at an early age to career paths. Um, it can be done on the elementary school level, the middle school level, the high school level. And what it does, it's, it brings uh, industry into the school system, whether you set it up like a, a style, like a career fair, or whether it's a, a school by school basis, but you're inviting entrepreneurs, um, leaders, employers into the school system to basically talk about careers. A lot of times students don't know the various career paths. You may have heard um, time and time again, there's not enough diversity in tech jobs, um, especially coming from uh, public school systems. Most of the, the schools that provide um, trades where students can, you know, graduate or, or earn their cosmetology license, automobile um, tech certification, CNA, we need to start incorporating interest in that at a younger age. So I would um, urge you to consider incorporating industry day as um, a form of engagement. And also, um, another thing, we need to connect our students to services. A lot of students are dealing with, you know, things at home. It, they bring it into the classroom that not able to focus. One of the things that the Maryland Alliance for Justice Reform is working on is ending the school to prison pipeline because we know when individuals do not graduate with their high school diploma, their propensity to end up in prison is higher. And so it's important to have a clearinghouse. So I also encourage Baltimore County and the school system to incorporate solutions from the nonprofit sector. We know budget constraints are a concern, so you may not be able to incorporate all of the ideas, but it's also a good thing to reach out to nonprofit organizations who have after school programs. I've seen uh, a lot of corporations. Thank you. Our ninth speaker tonight is Gigi Aya Robertson. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Gigi Aya Robertson, and I serve the BP BCPS and my community as a behavior interventionist and equity coordinator at Milford Mill Academy and a special education lead at Woodlawn EDLP. I want to thank the board for its courageous commitment to mitigating the achievement gap for our most underrepresented students. Specifically, I Specifically, I serve the West Zone community in several capacities where our most marginalized students rely on us to both provide high quality education and stand in the gap to ensure that their voices are heard. I am advocating for additional resources, both human and tangible, that support a reduction in the achievement gap and support instructional and um, support staff resources in schools where the need is greater as it is in the West Zone. I am particularly speaking on behalf of our special education students and those students whose families require additional supports and resources to navigate their unique challenges. Our special educators and related services staff are spread thin. We are committed to the work that inspires us, but we require additional resources if we are to make significant gains as outlined in the BCPS Blueprint 2.0. Special educators and support staff often suffer from burnout, and we want to continue to encourage and support and primarily retain my amazing colleagues as we seek to keep student engagement and achievement the focus of our work. Equity requires providing what is needed to ensure that the playing field is fair. To reduce the disparity that exists, we must listen to, observe, 
and often ensure that our students hear us when we speak back with them in order to be effectively responsive by committing to increasing the level of resources to those we know need it most. Just as each of you have a unique contribution and it strengthens this board, our schools have unique needs that are not easily evident in current staffing and resource calculations. Our students require more. Milford Mill is the flagship of our community and our programming and resources should reflect its flagship status. I commend my colleagues at both Milford Mill Academy and the Weeknight Warriors at Woodlawn EDLP for their commitment to excellence in the face of significant challenges. Our students inspire us with their courage and commitment to succeed. Help us to ensure that we are knowledgeable about their unique challenges through increased professional development opportunities, adequate facilities, increased staffing, and fiscal support for responsive programming. I would also like to speak in support of our student representative to this board, Ms. Halimad Adekoya. Thank you. And our final speaker for this evening is Mr. Justin Gordon. Okay. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Justin Gordon, and I'm the president of Robotics Club, um, historian for National Honor Society, and a member of the National Technical Honor Society. Since my freshman year, I have attended Milford constantly, witnessing the lack of basic resources and standards for the students and staff. S students in the West Zone do not have many of the benefits that aid students in being successful after college. We also lack basic materials that help teachers to properly teach us, such as paper, paper, books, and teachers in general. We do not have enough teachers so the classrooms become overpopulated, causing less one-on-one causing less one -on -one time with students that hinders learning, learning the materials necessary to fully understand the course, which is only one of many issues that is not beneficial to a student's success. With all these issues going on, not only at Milford, but in the West Zone as a whole, my colleague, Holly Matt Etikoya, class president and student member of the board, has been working extremely hard to make the West Zone schools better for not only the students, but the staff as well. Students located in the West Zone of Baltimore County have not had a voice and an advocate for us in our needs. I commend her for being a leader for Milford to assure that the West Zone improves for students and staff. Her efforts are grand, and with the voice of Holly Matt and the entire school standing behind her, I strongly believe Milford will become a great learning environment. As a representative of students, I urge you as a country to heed to, to the complaints, concerns, and cries of the country who express their needs daily. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes our public comment portion. Our next agenda item is item F, superintendent's report. Ms. White. Thank you. So happy new year, everyone, and welcome back. I want to start by wishing our entire BCPS family a very happy and healthy new year. It is wonderful to see classrooms bustling once again with the enthusiasm and energy of our students and staff. I'm encouraged by the active involvement and engagement of our community this year, which is reflected in the operating budget proposal that I will bring to the board later this evening. In terms of some reminders for the community, I wanted to remind you of Team BCPS Day. This is just one more reminder that Team BCPS Day is this Thursday, January 10th. For one day, we'll see blue hair, blue lights, <laughs> and blue outfits, lots of blue outfits. Uh, hopefully on social media as we share photos using the hashtag, uh, hashtag BCPS Blue. 
Uh, one more reminder that has to do with the stakeholder survey. Before the board convenes again, our stakeholder survey will launch. This is an incredible opportunity for students in grades 3 through 12 and all parents, staff, and community members to shape our budget, staffing, and programs as we look ahead. The survey will be available on our homepage from Friday, January 18th through Sunday, February 24th. So please do take a few moments to give us your feedback and encourage your colleagues and neighbors to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next agenda item is chair's report. So I'd just like to say on behalf of all of my colleague board members that we do also want to extend wishes for a happy, healthy, and successful new year. We hope our dedicated employees and our hardworking students and their families enjoyed the break and are rejuvenated for all the teaching, learning, and supporting that is coming in the months ahead. The board has now been sworn in for just over one month. That includes 10 days of the holiday and winter break, and I believe this board is making tremendous progress in engaging in governance and oversight of our large, complicated, beautifully diverse, and amazing school system, Team BCPS. We appreciate the efforts of our interim superintendent, her staff, also the board staff, in all of the activities that we've been engaged in um, in this one short month. We've had school visits, we've had uh, committee meetings, we've had conversations about how we're going to improve uh, the way that we operate. In that short month, uh, Vice Chair Hen and I started a new and collaborative and inclusive process in staffing our committees. And while we've heard a lot here tonight, I can say that we definitely agree with what the community says about the student voice being vital to our school system. So given that all board members had different levels of commitment and engagement, we have different opportunities that they wanted to be involved in. There's a wide variety of the committees and there's a wide variety of their staffing. So I just wanted to say that I wanted to go over this. This is up on the, um, our website, but they're really excited about the committees that we have and their staffing. The audit committee is, uh, has pointed out earlier, Russ Kuhn is the chair, I'll be the vice chair, and Lisa Mack is on that. We also have building and contracts, which has already been doing its work in the building and contracts meetings with Julie Hen as the chair, Lily Rowe as the vice chair, and Rod McMillian. The curriculum kid committee is gonna be kicking off next week with Lisa Mack as chair, Cheryl Pasteur as vice chair, Halima Adekoya will be on there, and also Rod McMillian. We have our legislative and governmental relations committee, which we are reinvigorating, and we have Cheryl Pasteur as the chair, Makita Scott as the vice chair, and Lily Rowe is gonna be contributing to that committee. On policy committee, we have Kathleen Causey, which is me, as the chair. John Offerman will be joining as vice chair. We have Alima Adekoya, Cheryl Pasteur, and Lily Rowe. And I'm very pleased to announce that in addition to these assignments, there are going to be other assignments that are coming. Uh, there are additional committees and special projects that board members have expressed interest in. And so there will be continued um, work on doing all of those positions that we need. But in addition to these appointments, we're very excited to announce that Ms. Adekoya has agreed to be the board liaison to the School Climate, Student Behavior, and Disciplined Citizens Advisory Council. This is newly formed, and this position is a tremendous need for the board. As we launch it, it's a very important group that will provide import input directly to the board about a number of very important issues that our community have raised and board members have raised over the recent months. So we're very excited about all that. Um, as we move forward this year, we're uh, very interested in receiving the budget that we're gonna get a first look at. The board is entering this process midstream. Looking, we're all looking forward to evaluating every precious dollar of funding that it's spent the most effective way to provide for the needed results of equity and excellence in educating each of our students. To invest in the professionals at every level to ensure safe, healthy, orderly, and effective teaching and learning environments and fair compensation for all of our, all, all of our employees. While the board is entering midstream, we look forward to the public informing us at the upcoming public hearing on their thoughts. Then there will be opportunity for this board to make modifications, additions, and to discuss with the interim superintendent and staff the ways that we can make sure that we're using our resources in the most effective way. 
Also coming up, as you've been hearing, is strategic capital construction plan for all system needs. We heard the recent report on the high school capacity study, and that is a very important and urgent need, but it's only one piece of the facility's need. There's also overcrowding at middle and some elementary schools. There, and also, as was pointed out here, in middle and high school, we need additional program space for increased career technology education, computer science, and we do need that equitable across the county. So we're looking forward to the capital budget addressing needs. We have talked in the past months and years about this board enacting a new strategic facilities plan, so hopefully we'll be hearing more about that. Um, as the board chair, I was pleased to give greetings recently at the TABCO ESPBC Legislative Breakfast, and uh, it was very good to engage in conversation. And also, I was pleased to give greetings to the FBLA Region 2 Conference, which included over 650 FBLA members, teachers, advisors, and business community members that are supporting our students in a great program to become ready for college and career and civic engagement. I, too, am excited for Team BCPS Day and look forward to hearing more about it and hope that we can all join in. So thank you. And with that, that concludes the chair's report. And our next report is from our student board member, Ms. Halima Adekoya. Good evening, everyone. Happy Tuesday and Happy New Year to all of you. As we begin our first board meeting for the new year, I wanted to take a moment to reflect on my service to the students in BCPS <coughs> over the past year. It has been my honor and privilege to represent the voice of the students of BCPS. I challenge students to continue to act and speak regarding your needs as unique learners. As students, we are the greatest stakeholders in all of BCPS. I challenge each of my fellow classmates to raise their voices, to fight for their beliefs, wants, and whatever resources they need to be successful. Only we as students understand and comprehend each of our individual necessities for success. We play an active role in our own education. Advocate for yourself, advocate for your schools, and be your own biggest fan. No one knows your individual needs as much as you know yourself. If your needs are not being met, raise your voice. Seek out supports and resources. Demand equity, equality, and inclusion in the safest, least restrictive learning environment. Demand rigor. Do not accept mediocrity or the status quo. The time for equality is never tomorrow, it is always today. Be your own champion, raise your voice, but remember, your actions speak volumes as well. Lead by example and practice what you preach. Take care of your own mental well-being and challenge the adult stakeholders in your education to always meet your needs. Thank you to those students who have shared their needs and I've been proud to speak on your behalf. It is my hope that I continue to serve you, the students of Baltimore County, in the utmost professional manner. It is my hope that we continue to move the work of the board in the new year with a sound moral compass, guiding our decisions to impact the lives of the youth of our community for many years to come. The future, the youth are not the future, they are now. Thank you. The next item on the board is unfinished business system record retention. <clears throat> Ms. Howie, thank you. Surely. So at a previous meeting, the following motion was postponed until this meeting. Uh, and that current motion is the board directs the interim superintendent and all BCPS personnel to immediately cease and desist in the routine non routine destruction of any and all school system documents and records that are subject to retention according to the BCPS record retention schedule, board policy, or applicable laws and regulations until further direction by the board. Further, the board directs that a litigation hold be placed on all system records that may, be reason that may reasonably be important to all phases of the contracts, procurement, and vendor relationships audit, including any further action which may be taken in response to the audit findings. Um, I am grateful for the interim superintendent for having uh, presented additional information to the board in both of the uh, weekly updates that we have uh, received since the last meeting. And I'm hoping that the board members had an opportunity to review that. So at this time, I would entertain motions.
I said at this time I would entertain motions from the board. Yes. Um, do we have in writing somewhere there was a, an email sent by the superintendent regarding a suggestion because Yes, uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Just as a reminder to the board and to the public as well, the and and fill us in as well. The the board directive that is already in place affects um, executive directors and above. So again, we are already retaining um, all correspondence and all documents uh, from that level and above. Uh, at, from at our last meeting. I just wanted to caution the board in terms of um, um, creating that type of mandate for the system. That happened already this year, and it was um, uh, problematic for the system and kind of clogging the system processes, which applied then to our teachers and to our administrators. And that was the correspondence that you received in the weekly update with all of the various things that would be really kind of problematic, I believe, not you know at not only at the central level but also in our classroom. So we just wanted to share that information so that you would have sound information to work from as you're making your decisions. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure who was first, but Ms. Hen. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Um, I would introduce a motion to amend the directive that was um, suggested by Ms. White as follows. The board directs the interim superintendent and all BCPS personnel assigned to the relevant offices to retain, maintain, and preserve all records kept by the Board of Education Office, the Office of the Superintendent, um, the Division of Business Services, the Office of Research and Accountability, the Office of Human Resources, the Ethics Review Panel, and the Office of the Chief of Staff until further notice. This amendment adds those offices um, that were originally included in the interim superintendent's motion. Is there a second? second. Uh, is discussion? Ms. Rowe? Oh, you can. Oh, oh I'm sorry, Ms. Joes. I would like to have our legal counsel, Mr. Nussbaum, give the entire board a legal briefing on the issue as well. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm prepared to give a legal a briefing on the entire issue. Ms. Howie, I know, has been working with the records retention, and she's probably in a better position to give you the details. Ms. Howie. Yes, ma'am. What's your specific question? Uh, could you just give us a brief uh, legal opinion of yours? I have a lot of opinions, <laughs> uh, so I will limit my um, my response. I believe I mentioned to the board at the, the last board meeting that under the state government article, it's actually 10611 of the state government article, that every unit of state government must have a records program. However, the Board of Education is not a unit of state government. As a result, the superintendent asked for uh, a program to be instituted in the school system. The school system is not, as I said, a unit, and because it's not a unit of state government, it's not required to have the program that the state has. The state, however, has been giving us advice about how to go forward, and we are using the state's process because that's a process that is in place. And when I say the state, I mean the state archives. The State Department of Education in 2005 issued guidance to all local education agencies, and that guidance indicated that all records programs had to be approved for LEAs by the State Department of Education. On December 1st, 2018, the state revised that guidance and said that if any records programs were going forward from LEAs, that the LEAs were to use the state archives process. That is what 
the school system has been doing as a result of Superintendent's Rule 2380, which is the local school system's records program, records management program, that is consistent with 10610 of the state government article. Ms. Rowe. So at our last meeting, we had some discussion about the records retention schedule, and now we've modified the motion to, in, instead of including everything on the records retention schedule, to specify records of specific offices. I believe it's divisions or, and one office. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but departments within the school system, specific ones. Yes, ma'am. Is that more acceptable and more tenable to the school system to implement that? Because I do think the board has an interest in making sure the documents are preserved for the current and any future audits. Is this an easier thing to accomplish? It's definitely more tailored, ma'am, and I believe that it will be um, easier for the school system. However, when you look at the entire division, of human resources, again, my question would be to the board, um, what whether or not there are specific offices that you believe uh, you'll need records from, for example, risk management. I'm not sure how workers' compensation records will assist the board. However, the staff will do what the board directs the staff to do. And appreciates that there is limit. There have been limitations placed. Okay. And I so would only add. I'm sorry. I would just add that you know when we talk about the division of business services, that incorporates our food services, transportation services, um, facilities, grounds, and uh, exactly um, which personnel would be affected by that. Again, um, are we? What problem? I think, are we trying to solve here? That would be the question so that we would know exactly which personnel would be affected. So are you saying that you would like it to be more narrowed? I'm saying that I believe, first of all, again, I have not heard that there hasn't anything, anything that has been asked for that we haven't been able to produce. That is my understanding. However, um, I would also keep in mind that with the current directive, with all executive directors and above, that is, um, I be that is the current directive that is already in place. Again, where all correspondence and all um, documents are already being retained. So again, to go layers be beneath that, what, um, what problem are we solving? Or would the board be trying to solve? Mr. Kuhn. Just so we're clear here, um, in the past, there was destruction of financial disclosure forms that were um, managed appropriate to schedules um, that had been agreed to. But the way that that was executed and the timing um, created a backlash from uh, the public associated with how the system is handling their business. So. If people are concerned about um, the why, I think that's a big driver here. Um, and it's been in the news, um, you know, multiple stakeholders are aware of it. And um, it's uh, concerning from a public integrity perspective. So I understand the concern about basically being too wide, casting too wide of a net. I think that uh, as a board, we're trying to uh, intelligently narrow that, but what I would suggest, and I think perhaps if there are, um, if there's further narrowing that is, is, is needed because of operational hurdles that the system cannot address, that we meet, need to be made aware of that so that we can continue to do that. I think the motion that um, Mrs. Hen has added that um, uh, interim Superintendent White had provided um, goes a long way to do that. Um, I'm not exactly sure, you know, I don't have a silver bullet. I can't say I know exactly this or that. I think the unknown piece is, is what uh, gives 
um, at least be pause when I, I'm, you know, uh, sitting there trying to, to continue to narrow it down thinner and thinner. So um, I think that everyone here needs to understand that and our stakeholders out in the community uh, certainly would like to understand that and, and know that the board is looking out um, and, and, you know, building trust uh, so that they can um, really um, have faith in what we're doing is the best thing for the public. Ms. Rowe. I think that casting the net a little bit wider, if it's not some really overwhelming encumbrance on the school system to do what we're asking them to do <coughs> is probably exactly what stakeholders, the county council, other elected officials expected when they all wanted an audit. And I don't want for us not to really consider the potential that when we hear the results of this audit, that if there's recommendations for future and more expanded audits based on these findings, that we didn't take steps in order to preserve the information that's necessary. And I do think that having a couple thousand documents destroyed and the timing of that makes it very reasonable for this board to put a little bit of burden on the school system to preserve documentation. Other comments or questions? I would just want to make a comment that um, in the information, and I do appreciate Ms. White and I'm sure Ms. Howie and other staff uh, contributed to this, put together the uh, memo, it's dated December 21st. Um, one of the issues, one of the statements was that um, in the spring, staff members in compliance with the policy purged records as required by the policy. Um, that word required is not really appropriate, I believe. It's permitted by policy, but it's not required as in they must be destroyed after four years. So um, that's something that I think um, needs to be known. The other issue is um, that with the external audit, as Mr. Kuhn pointed out and can confirm for me, there have been no reports from the external audit company. So we don't know if part of the report is are there documents they ask for and they cannot find? So we don't have a report or a statement from them. That's my understanding since they've not given a report or an update uh, to the audit committee. Um, so I would say that that's a question mark. That's not a, that's not a known entity. And I do think uh, along the lines of uh, Mr. Kuhn that in trying to narrow it to make it tenable, uh, make it operationally possible, uh, for the school system that that is important. And what we're talking about here is not uh, unending, it's potentially preserving what's already being preserved for perhaps a certain number of months. And as the audit committee starts and as the external auditor presents a draft report or an update, uh, whatever it is that they're going to be um, doing in the next few weeks, then we will certainly know more about where we are. So I think it is, as Ms. Rowe pointed out, reasonable to cast a net and to make it operationally tenable, uh, but also to be reasonable. And excuse me, members of the board, I apologize. I misstated the uh, state government article section. It's 10610. That's the records management program. And your policy concerning financial disclosures says that financial disclosure forms shall be retained for four years. Yes, they shall be retained, but it does not Correct. say that they shall be, shall be destroyed retained. afterwards. It indicates that they must be retained for that period. That is correct. Yes. Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mrs. Causey. Before we vote on this motion, I thought it would be useful to the board to repeat the motion as read with the list of offices that this would pertain to. 
Um, a list of those offices, by the way, if you're on online is bcps.org slash offices. You can see the departments within each division. But the motion um, would read, the board directs the interim superintendent and all BCPS personnel assigned to the relevant offices to retain, maintain, and preserve all records kept by the Board of Education Office, the Office of the Superintendent, the Division of Business Services, the Ethics Review Panel, the Office of Human Resources, the Division of Research Accountability and Assessment, and the Office of the Chief of Staff. So once again, those, um, some of the departments, um, it was brought up by, by Ms. White within the Division of Business Services that this would apply to include administrative services, IT, business services operations, fiscal services, which includes purchasing, payroll, budget and reporting, the Office of the Controller, financial reporting, general accounting, um, the Department of Facilities Management, and Office of Facilities Operations with, within those, as well as several others. But you can refer to that listing on the webpage for complete details. And also, just as a reminder to the public and to the board as well, I just want to remind everyone in terms of clarify one thing that uh, Ms. Causey stated in terms of the, the audit report. Certainly, I have not received a copy of the report either. However, um, the staff has to turn over several documents. And, and I say that because, you know, as a reminder, I called for the audit on September 26, 2017. So I just want that to be clear as well, that this was not initial, initiated by the Board of Education. I initi initiated the audit on September 26, 2017. And as a result of that, um, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that we have, been, we have had to turn over thousands and thousands of documents. So although we don't have a report, certainly the auditors would have let us know if there was anything that they had asked for that we were unable to produce. So we, there is no um, document as of yet. We don't have a report as of yet. But we have not received notice that based on the documents that we have produced, that we have been unable to produce anything that they have asked for. Thank you for that clarification. I do want to say also that on that same date, the board voted for the audit. I believe that motion was made by Mr. Hayden. So the board did vote for an audit to take place. I think, Ms. Hen, what might be helpful is to um, point out that the motion that you made was submitted to us by Ms. White and that you are making the addition of what, two offices? That's correct. I'm expanding Ms. White's motion, which included the Office of Purchasing and the Office of Accounting to encompass the Division of Business Services, which is casting the net wider, but includes both of those. Um, I'm adding the Chief of Staff the, and Research Accountability and Assessment. And just to keep and in mind that the chief of staff is a direct report to me, as well as the Department of Research Accountability and Assessment. So those offices are already included in the motion that is already underway and that is being implemented um, to date for executive directors and above. So chief of staff. It includes all of my direct reports, which will be all chiefs, all community superintendents, all executive directors and above. Uh, so in, in terms of adding more, I think that would be um, unnecessary, I guess, given that it's already like that in the current directive. Thank you for that clarification. Ms. Hen, how would that? Thank you for that clarification. It's broken out differently on the website, so I appreciate that clarification. So Ms. Hen, would you want to take an opportunity to restate your motion or to remove it and you can state a new one. Um, sure, to exclude, just to clarify, to exclude the Office of the Chief of Staff, the Office of Research Accountability and Assessment, those were the two that fall under the Office of the Superintendent. That would require uh, approval by the person who seconded it. Okay. Ms. Rowe, thank you for that approval. Are there any other comments or questions before? Okay, I think we should go ahead and take a vote. Do you want to read that one more time, Ms. Hen? Sure. The board directs the interim superintendent and all BCPS personnel assigned to the relevant offices to retain, maintain, and preserve all records kept by the Board of Education Office, the Office of the Superintendent, the Division of Business Services, 
the Ethics Review Panel, the Office of Human Resources um, until further notice. And I do beg the board's pardon, but there is not an Office of Human Resources. It's a division. My bad. I stand corrected. The Division of Human Resources. Thank you, Ms. Howie. And also, for clarification, this would then uh, pertain to all personnel, correct, in those offices? That is correct. Okay. I, again, I would just uh, caution the board. We have lots of personnel in these offices. I know that we um, uh, talked about this and we've had some discussion, and certainly we will follow the board's directive. Um, however, we need to, whatever way the board um, chooses to, but we receive lots of information and emails from parents and from teachers and from um, various stakeholders. We want to make sure that we're getting back in a timely fashion. Um, I've heard some uh, discussion tonight about how we might um, manage, and so I just want to make sure that we understand that that would um, require all personnel in those uh, departments and divisions to keep everything, um, which could be a bit problematic. So I just wanted to share that for the board's consideration. I'm not sure that the keeping everything is is the proper reflection because it starts with the documents that are in a document retention schedule and then it backs up to these offices. And there was conversation in previous meetings months ago related to the emails that as long as our IT staff maintains emails backed up on the network that our employees can utilize their emails as they normally would because they're not destroyed because the IT department is maintaining them on the network. Is that? I'm not an IT specialist. I do recall that part of the discussion, and I'll certainly defer to someone who understands the, um, the specifics, but as I recall, at the time, the issue was, and this was the board's first directive, that the issue was whether or not when an individual employee pressed delete, that meant that the email was gone forever. I see Mr. Oh. Corns is here to Sorry. help us out. If you would just uh, please state your title for the rest of the board that's not familiar with your work. Sure, I'm Jim Corns. I'm the Executive Director of Information Technology. So uh, as part of our processes with our emails, we do run a, uh, a retention of them. So even if an uh, uh, employee were to delete them, we would have them in place. So when we use the term legislative hold, that indicates that we are going to uh, suspend any um, automatic deletions that we would have after a certain amount of time that uh, we have processes and policies and uh, regulations that dictate how often uh, we purge emails on a rolling schedule, but with a legislative hold, we would have those emails stored in arrears. Um, I will take back to make sure that we don't have a capacity limit on our, our storage so that if there is a cost incurred, we can uh, litigation hold. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Howie. <laughs> I was waiting for him to take a breath to say litigation. Hold, yeah. But there you so go. <laughs> uh, we, we just simply need to make sure that uh, we don't have to uh, expand our, our storage for that. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate you. So I guess the question is, it sounds as if there is currently a hold on the emails that Mr. Korn's office is overseeing yes. or? For the executive staff, I believe. Yes, ma'am. Executive staff. So it would be extended to um, these other offices if the motion is approved? I believe so, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Scott. Thank you so much. Um, I was just curious. I heard um, some sort of inference to what sort of um, impact this could have. I guess I want to know, could this cause um, a more of a Im heavier impact or burden to the overall schoolhouse? And if so, what what would that look like? Like, could that cause things to come to a halt? Could it impact um, individual schools? Could it cause additional work for principals? I'm, I'm just curious about that. I do think it may have an impact on our organizational effectiveness. And I can just say, even from the executive director level and above, again, we have boxes and boxes of documents, you know, that we're holding on to. But it's also a matter of just think about when, um, you know, the ability to be able to delete and sort and those kinds of things, they can be retained. But it is also, um, I think, a hardship, and particularly for all personnel in an, in an office of any uh, type. 
I think that in terms of the responsiveness at the central level to schools, it could be um, a bit problematic. We don't know the entire outcome yet. Um, we would have to wait and see. Are there any other comments or questions before we take a vote? Okay, if I could have a show of hands, all in favor of Ms. Hen's motion. That's seven. Opposed? Were there any abstentions? The motion carries. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is new business, personnel matters. For that, I call Dr. Mayo forward. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey. Vice Chairwoman Hinn, Superintendent White, members of the board, I would like board consent for the following personnel matters, resignations, leaves of absence, and certificated appointments. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits J1 through J3? Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is new business, administrative appointments, and for that, I ask Ms. White. Thank you, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments, Senior Auditor, Office of Internal Audit. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointment as presented in Exhibit K-1? Motion. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Any opposed? Thank you, the motion carries. The next item on, oh, Ms. White, are you going to make an announcement? No. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next item of business is L, new business, action taken in closed session. For that, I ask Mr. Nussbaum to come forward. There wasn't any. Oh, well, thank you. Maybe we'll catch up. Okay, item M, new business, privately funded capital projects. For that, I ask Mr. Roberts. Good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Tonight, I bring forward for your approval to privately funded capital improvement projects for the purchase and installation of playground equipment. The first is for Essex Elementary. Existing playground equipment will be removed and 36 pieces of new equipment installed at Essex Elementary. The new playground equipment will be dedicated as part of the 100th anniversary of Essex Elementary School. The project is being funded entirely by the Essex Elementary PTA and is in line with BCPS policy and Rule 7330. And in accordance with this policy, the request has progressed through all normal channels. The cost of the project is $28,540.46, all of which has been remitted to Essex Elementary School. And in support of the project this evening is the principal, Brooke Wagner, to the left, Randy Quinn, assistant principal, Candy Dean, PTA President, Sarah Kyle, PTA Vice President, Amy Schaefer, a parent and PTA member, and Tiffany Boblitz, parent, PTA member. Thank you for Coming. that and thank you all for being here. Do I have a motion to approve the installation of new playground equipment at Essex Elementary School? Motion. As a graduate of Essex Elementary School, I would like to make that motion. Do I have a second? Ms. Gover, did you <laughs> keep track of that one? Um, do we have any discussion or comments? Mr. Hayden. Can we ask Mr. McMillian how many years it took him to get out of the... <laughs> <laughs> I attended first through sixth grade in six years. <laughs> so it was you that wore out the swing set. <laughs> Ms. Mack. I would just like to say that my last order of business working on our Butis Elementary School's PTA was to get the money to put in a new playground. So I know how hard you worked and I applaud your efforts. With that, all in favor, please raise your hand. 
Wonderful. It was unanimous, so the motion carries. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you board. so much for being here. So the second item is for Edgemere Elementary School, and this is a pri also a privately funded capital campaign improvement project for the purchase and installation of playground equipment um, for pre-kindergarten and kindergartners at Edgemere Elementary School. The project will entail is this existing asphalt pads will be removed and replaced with the playground equipment at Edgemere. This project also is being funded entirely by the Edgemere Elementary PTA in line with BCPS policy and rule 7330. In accordance with this policy, this request has also progressed through all channels, and the cost of this project is $34,396.50, all of which has been remitted to Edgemere Elementary School. And tonight, in support of this is the principal, Chuck, or Charles Ament. Chuck Ament. <coughs> Chuck, thanks for coming. Thank you for that. Do I have a motion to approve the installation of new playground equipment at Edgemere Elementary School? I did not attend Edgewood Elementary School. <laughs> However, I would like to make that motion. Thank you. And who will like to second? Okay. Um, is, any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The vote is unanimous and the motion carries. Oh, thank thank you. you very much and thank you, Mr. Roberts. The next item of, of business is item N, new business, contract awards. For that, I would ask Mr. Dix, Dixit and Mr. Saris to please come forward. Good evening. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items N1 through N29 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. The recommendation of the committee for item N30 is that it be moved to the curriculum committee for further consideration. Do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N29? Do I have a second? Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion on any of those contracts? Oh, actually, no second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. And the next item is, oh, Ms. Mack. Okay, is there a second? I would ask, um, Ms. Hen, is that necessary since the Building and Contracts <laughs> Committee we took it out? The recommendation of the Building and Contracts Committee is that the full board um, postpone the vote. However, a motion is needed in order to take that action. Okay, so thank you, Ms. Mack, for making that motion. And who seconded that? Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe. Oh, uh, Ms. Pastor. Pasteur, thank you. Uh, is there any discussion at this time? Can we ask the superintendent what kind of impact this would have on the system? Thank you, Mr. Hayden. Thank you. Uh, as I think was stated at the last uh, board meeting, uh, uh, certainly we will honor the board's request in the timeline as well to go to the curriculum committee. Keep in mind, however, though, that by taking this action, we do have to um, wait on to dis determine those three levels of implementation when it comes to our math uh, curriculum. We're trying to get a handle on our uh, sequence, our course sequence. We're also trying to look at our um, kind of our destination of where we want our math um, performance to land. And it's, it's going to take us some time to determine whether or not that pathway is sound based on uh, the various interactions. So the longer we postpone, the, uh, the longer it will take us to get that information so that we can make adjustments to the curriculum if they're needed. Ms. Mack? We are, very, we are very sensitive to that, and um, we are working as quickly as we can to have the review that we're talking about. Um, as you know, I issued a series of questions that I haven't even had time to look at yet. But again, being conscious of the time constraint, we are working to have that done next week. Thank you. appreciate that. Any other questions or comments? 
If I could see a show of hands to uh, support Ms. Mack's motion. <laughs> Any opposed? Any abstentions? Ms. Gover, did you have yeah. that? The motion carries. Thank you. Our next item is item O, new business report on the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget. And for that, I ask Ms. White. Thank you. Uh, good evening again, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, members of the board. Tonight, I am excited to, bring, to present the FY20 proposed operating budget. Um, before I get started, I just would like to take care of a few housekeeping <laughs> items for the board. Um, as an overview of the budget timeline and an order of events, the board will receive just an overview tonight. So tonight isn't necessarily a question and answer. We're going to have a lot of time for that. But this is a general presentation to the board and to the public um, for the budget request tonight. I'll work with the board officers to determine um, how we might do two by twos or two at a time where we can come in, where you can do a deep dive into the budget, um, how we might answer questions and how they may be posted for the public. Um, there will be a board hearing on January 15th. There will be a board work session on January 22nd. And there will be an anticipated board vote on February 5th. So therefore, the board will have, you'll have a lot of time uh, to go through the budget book, which you have received here on your desk, and uh, which is also going to be online um, for the public, as well as several weeks to answer um, to ask questions of staff and to receive those answers as well. So we have well over a month together to um, to really vet and work through the budget together. It is, um, uh, we have a large school system, we have the budget to match that. So um, but we do <laughs> want to honor your questions and have good time together. First, I would like to thank, start by thanking the many community and staff members who put forth great effort toward helping our team craft a budget that is not only forward thinking and fiscally responsible, but also child centered, inclusive, and responsive to school and student needs. So again, thank you. Your contribution of time, talent, and ener energy is greatly appreciated. We can't do this alone, and we can't do this without your voice. And so thanks again to the student staff and to the community. We are also very fortunate in Baltimore County to have the support of not only the community, but also our elected officials who know and understand the importance of a high quality educational program. I've also had conversations with our county executive who also supports education uh, and, and about ways in which we can continue our forward motion as while also taking into consideration the fiscal realities that are in front of us. So if it's even possible, I am just as excited about this year's budget request as I was when I presented last year's budget request that was entitled uh, People for Our People. So bear with me a minute and I'll try to contain my excitement as I go through. So no worries, this year's uh, budget still is still focused on our most valuable resources, as you heard tonight. Um, many uh, folks are still asking for the people request. Again, we are in a people business. We serve um, people. And so in terms of from our youngest learners to those who even still may have beards, but they're still our young learners. Um, and uh, so we want to make sure that we have adequate human resources um, to meet their needs. This proposal, again, has a significant request with regard to people for our people, particularly in the areas of special education and ESOL, as well as additional staffing to support the academics. This year's budget theme is entitled Balancing Our Priorities because it is time and it is, it is time and it makes good common sense for us to balance our priorities. Over the course of the past 18 months, I've held countless town hall style meetings and advisory council meetings where I've learned a great deal about what our staff, students and community members <coughs> want from their school system. That list includes continued momentum on the people for our people request, 
a continued focus on literacy and responsive instruction. Class sizes are certainly uh, something that has been of great focus for our staff members. Um, a focus, a in continued focus on literacy and responsive instruction, and emphasis on early learning and developmentally appropriate practices for our youngest learners, and increased focus on student behavior and discipline. Uh, resources to support our transportation needs, as well as a continued commitment towards uh, supporting our schools via their school budgets in terms of staffing and instructional support. I believe that this budget and my budget proposal tonight addresses each of those requests, and I'm happy to share it with you at this time. So let's start with our instructional program. We need to continue providing literacy-based responsive classrooms where students are able to work with both print and digital materials. Students need to be actively engaged in learning and our youngest learners need to be immersed in those things that matter most like vocabulary development, handwriting development, basic skill development that will provide them with the foundational skills necessary to take on rigorous material um, particularly as a preparation for the secondary level and beyond. We also have to do this in a way that ensures student data privacy and that would be al aligned with our practices here in BCPS. Along the way, we have wrapped these instructional practices and guidelines into our STAT initiative. STAT launched in 2013 and included many teaching and learning components but also included uh, operational components as well. Tonight I would like to speak to and address the instructional side of STAT. And I'm proposing an adjustment to STAT that will preserve the instructional integrity of the program and will also save the school system at least $15 million over the next three years. I understand that this plan is bold but I also believe that new guidelines provide us with an opportunity like none other in recent years. The adjusted plan would shift from a ratio, from a one-to-one -one ratio for grades one, kindergarten one and two to two-to-one for the primary grades to allow access to technology and responsive instruction, yes, but also to honor the developmentally appropriate recommendations that were proposed by the School Health Council. As an early childhood educator myself, it is important, and I can speak to the fact that it is very important for students to learn how to use technology responsibly and learn all of those basic foundational technological skills, absolutely. But it's also important for them to have more time to move and to be engaged in group activities and, for, and vocabulary development in a print-rich environment. This adjustment allows for that to happen. Other benefits of the plan overall allows us uh, to preserve the teaching and learning environment without disruption. Um, we are able to uh, look at ongoing implementation of the School Health Council's recommendations, again, beginning in the primary grades. A continued, it gives us a, a continued emphasis on people for our people. So by doing so, we're able to look at how we can still increase staffing in our human resources. It will give increased device access for our paraeducators. Many of you as board members, you have heard our paraeducators call for access um, to devices, the devices that students had but our paraeducators didn't have. It will give us additional support for Id identified schools under ESSA. So when we talk about how, what are we doing for our schools that received one and two stars and what, how are we supporting them, this uh, change in this shift will give us the opportunity to support them directly and it will give us an opportunity to redirect some funds to school budgets and uh, to increase school budgets so that principals have more autonomy when it comes to their school budgets and they have uh, it, they have some re replenishment and reinstatement of their school budgets as well after much research and, and I want to also state that it's not just the adjustment that has to do um, with the ratio. What I'm proposing also is an adjustment in the device itself. 
So I'm proposing a shift in the type of device at the elementary level to move from the current Windows devices to Chromebooks. After much research, we have found that the use of Chromebooks will reduce the need for school servers, will be compatible with BCPS technology, will provide access to Microsoft Online and Microsoft OneDrive for storage, and will strengthen our internet filtering. And as you can see from the picture on the slide, um, they look, the look and the feel of the device would be nearly identical to the current device that students are currently using today. But you may ask, why? Why now? Why haven't we done this before? And what, what's the deal? Why, isn't this, why is this good now and it wasn't good before? So BCPS has been a leader in ensuring student data privacy. We have been steadfast in honoring that commitment. However, in May, and so we, anything that we did, any purchases that we made had to honor our student data privacy policies and rules and had to make sure that that was uh, the case. That was not the case before May of 2018. In May of 2018, new data privacy guidelines went into effect in the European U Union, which changed the way that many corporations operate regards to, uh, with regard to data privacy. These new, more stringent guidelines now align with our board policies, giving us an opportunity at this time to again save millions of dollars over the next three years especially, and to shift those funds to where we need them the most, such as, again, I want to go back to, um, we are able to do this, preserve the teaching and learning environment. Nothing is going to change in terms of curriculum access. We are going to force the issue, though, at the primary grades so that we can reduce screen time in the primary grades and look at ways to engage students actively um, with those foundational skills, the reading, writing, thinking, and those critical thinking skills at the, in the primary levels that are so critically important, um, but what, by also then creating a, a technology environment where they will still have access. Um, they will not be on the device all the whole class at the same time, but in the primary grades, we want to make sure that that doesn't happen, that they have an opportunity for small group instruction. <coughs> and speaking of um, thinking about people for our people, thinking about this cost savings, again, with um, at least, uh, and we're, I'm being very conservative here when I'm talking about it, and at least a $15 million savings over the next three three years, we're able to do significant things in terms of staffing and looking at increasing our school budgets and reinstating some of that money into our school budgets. That, that will be huge. That's something that our um, principals have been asking for. And thinking about that targeted support um, for our schools. And I'm going to get into what that targeted support might look like in just a second. As you can see in this slide, and I just want to and just take a second to talk about our people for our people portion of the budget. Um, as you can see in this slide, BCPS has focused on adding positions to critical areas of high need, which I, again, I will talk about throughout this presentation. Again, I am proud of the budget that was passed last year um, because our schools benefit when we add the human resources necessary to meet our students' needs. This chart that you have in front of you shows the growth in staffing in the areas of special education and ESOL. Uh, and you know that we came with a bold request last year, but because of the actions of the Board of Education and of our elected officials, we were able to get those critical resources that we so needed, that our teachers, our teachers' union, our um, bargaining agencies asked for in terms of more counselors, more PPWs, more psychologists, to emphasize the social-emotional learning supports of our students as well. We have to think about not only the academics, but how do we wrap our arms around students and their families to help 
help them succeed as we teach the whole child. And so this budget request asks for more positions there as well. And I'll get into the details with that as I move forward. So together, how do we move forward in terms of being focused, um, being forward, moving forward and being focused together? As we move forward in our investments, we should be reminded, and I think it's important that as a board, particularly as a new board coming on board, for you to know where we've spent money, how we've used our funds, and what, were, what was the yield? What was the return on our investment? We need to know some of the successes and some of the accomplishments that we have as a school district and a school system that we really need to not forget because when we're doing something well, we need to make sure that we're maintaining that type of momentum. We are proud of the fact that BCPS performed the way that BCPS formed on our recently MSDE star ratings. 99% um, of our elementary schools earning three to five stars, 62% of our middle schools doing excuse me, doing the same, and 83% of our high schools um, doing the same as well. While the BCPS graduation rate continues to increase, college matriculation rates have remained stable, and more students are enrolling in their second year of college. So it's not just a matter of getting students into college, and it's not just a matter of issuing a diploma. Again, issuing a diploma is our reasonable service. It's what we're supposed to do and do well to make sure that our students are adequately prepared. But we have to do more than that to make sure that our students are beyond adequately prepared, that they have the experiences that they need in order to move forward and to be um, successful in their lives. So it's also the fact that matricula matriculation rates have remained stable, and it's good news for our system, and it's a good news for our graduates. They are able to persevere and continue. We are also able to celebrate an 89% overall graduation rate for the class of 2017. The BCPS graduation rate exceeds the Maryland state average of 87.7%. I'd also like to recognize our other successes as well. We continue to be recognized for significant ac accomplishments in many areas that I'm, I don't want us to forget and for us to realize and to celebrate those accomplishments. We have 25 Maryland Blue Ribbon schools. Pine Grove Elementary School was just named our newest and most recent Maryland Blue Ribbon School. We have 21 national Blue Ribbon schools. West Towson Elementary School is our most recent national Blue Ribbon school. We have seven BCPS high schools ranked among the nation's best, according to US News and World Report. We also realize successes in other areas as well. We are named, BCPS is named one of the best communities for music education by the NAM Foundation for the 13th consecutive year and the 14th year overall. We reorganized this past summer um, our organization to support school success and to emphasize school safety and discipline, excuse me, and school climate. We were able to implement the Baltimore County Cares for Kids nutrition program. And we encourage stronger partnerships to support workforce development and apprenticeship opportunities for BCPS works. So when we, when we hear comments like the industry day and those kinds of things, we are already on that forward momentum to make sure that we have credentialing for our students. And we're looking in this budget to increase those credentialing opportunities for our young people. And we streamlined Parent University to address mental health and pre-adolescent and adolescent behaviors and ideations as well. Um, in terms of financial awards, I think it's important for uh, the board and the public to know that we have received an, um, several awards in the area of uh, financial reporting and financial awards. We received the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting from ASBO for the 22nd consecutive year. We received the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association for the 22nd consecutive year. We received the Meritorious Budget Award from ASBO for Excellence in Preparation of our School System Budget for the 16th consecutive year. And we received the Annual Achievement of Excellence in Procurement Award from the National Procurement Institute for the 14th 
consecutive year. And I applaud our budget and finance offices for these tremendous achievements, as well as our administrators and central office staff for these incredible accomplishments. And moving forward, it is also important for us to be reminded of the students we serve. And I think it's important for us to go through our demographic makeup in terms of who we are. So BCPS serves nearly 114,000 students, of whom 44% are eligible for free and reduced priced meals. They are from 100, our students are from 116 countries that are represented in our school system who speak 92 different languages. And so again, we are beautifully diverse. Uh, the needs of our students, however, are increasing. We have a rapidly growing second la language population, and each year students are entering kindergarten less and less prepared. Many of you heard me at the Tabco breakfast on Saturday mention that when that occurs, particularly in the primary grades, we are having to make double and triple jumps to make sure that we're catching kids up um, academically so that they don't fall too far behind. And so we want to make sure that we have the resources in place to support them. Our graduation rate has continued to climb, while at the same time we have closed the graduation gap and for our African American and between our African American and white students. If you take a look at the pie chart on this next slide, um, you can see the demographic shift in Baltimore County Public Schools from 1986 to present day. We are currently a majority minority school system. And so when it comes to our increasing population, our increasing numbers, BCPS has seen a 33% increase in the number of students eligible for free and reduced price meals over the past decade, while our English learners have grown 113% and the number of students who are homeless went up by 126% over the past 10 years. And as far as the school system, I am very proud of our staff. BCPS has at attacked hunger straight on. 100% of our students who are eligible for free and reduced price meals now receive their meals for free. And that is due to our investment as a school system. With regard to special education, several student populations requiring the most intensive support grew much faster than our overall enrollment. These students require greater support and specially trained staff. BCPS now serves significantly more students with disabilities. Again, we're up about 27, 28 percent of students who are being diagnosed with autism. Uh, we are up 46 percent for students who are, have been diagnosed with developmental delays. And we are up 50 percent of students who have been diagnosed with multiple disabilities than just five years ago. So BCPS's 2020 budget continues to add instructional positions dedicated to the support of, the, of students with disabilities. In terms of English learners, our English learners increased, like I said, significantly over the past 10 years, 12% over the past year. And as you can see, we grew by an additional 145 students just over the past two months. I'll say that again. We grew by an additional 145 uh, English learners just over the past two months. So we will uh, continue to propose additional staff over the next several years to address the concerns that we hear repeatedly from the community. I just want you to know for all of our community members, we hear you and we are making progress. We are taking a thoughtful approach to allow us to hire more of these highly qualified and high demand staff over the next several years. For special education alone, we are uh, requesting 50.5 special education positions. We are also requesting 21 ESOL positions that are proposed in this budget. I want to take some time to go through literacy and mathematics, again, areas of great concern to our community. It's important to keep in mind when we talk about literacy, we're not just talking about reading. And we're not just talking about reading and writing. 
It's reading, writing, thinking, listening, speaking across the disciplines because it's relevant in every subject area. And so we want to make sure that our students are adequately prepared. And this is particularly true for our youngest learners. So as our kindergartners arrive less prepared and addi additional resources are required to catch them up, you will see uh, a modest uptick in readiness. There's some data here for you, that uh, the readiness data that we have from FY18. But note that still less than 50% of our early learners are entering or showing up at the kindergarten door, kindergarten ready. And that was, that's different. That's a change from years ago. And many of us who have been around for some time know that that's, that wasn't the case years ago. But it is the case now. And we're not complaining about it, but we just want to make sure that we have the resources that we need to catch them up so that they don't fall too far behind. Early childhood and pre-K will continue to be an area of focus for us. The FY 2020 BCPS budget will add four half-day programs, which will allow us to serve 80 additional students, uh, again, in pre-K. And earlier, I spoke about the benefits of the adjusted STAT plan. Those adjustments will also allow us to provide focused support to our ESSA-identified schools and programs. This extra support will go by way of instructional coaching support, extra professional development, and uh, time for our teachers in terms of how we might uh, re look at math resource teachers and how we might support instruction through co-planning, co co-planning uh, co and co-teaching opportunities to support our classroom teachers. It's also going to look like additional support in terms of the materials that are provided. Materials, intervention materials, materials not only to support the, um, the, the classroom instruction, but also those materials that will help catch kids up in terms of that intervention support. And climate support. Many times, schools that are struggling will talk about student behavior and discipline as, uh, as a barrier and something that they're up against. And how do they get kids to get to school? And how does that work in terms of attendance? Um, so we want to make sure that we are investing in overall climate support, particularly for schools that are struggling. So that's going to look by way of additional counselors in schools, social workers, and psychologists to support the overall educational environment, particularly for schools that are struggling. So that, that is a differentiated staffing model for our struggling schools. So to that end, this budget proposal will allow us to continue our efforts to support schools, including an increased F emphasis on math professional development, our passport program, we've had a very uh, kind of slow and methodical approach to beginning Spanish instruction at the fourth grade level. This budget, again, goes along with that methodical approach to that uh, slow implementation and rollout. It will reinstate funding to our magnet programs, consider students eligible for a seal of biliteracy upon graduation at the high school level, with a continued investment in our GT students and a continued investment in our science program. So it's important for us to also keep in mind that this list shows our commitment to continuing our successful programs that we know that work, that directly support our students, that have a direct impact on our students, such as um, our high school dual enrollment program, our CTE expansion, again, looking at the credentialing of our students, the AVID and college readiness programs, um, transportation for extended day learning programs, SAT school day, and middle school and high school summer transition programs. In terms of STAT, again, it's important to keep in mind that there was already a planned reduction. So I talked about the $15 million over time, over the next three years, as a cost savings. And so we're looking at that to really happen in year two and three. But in the immediate, there will be, uh, an, in addition to that, a savings, um, a planned savings of $4.5 million that are included in the FY20 budget through a refreshed uh, device 
price lease and reduce training and BCP, BCPS1 <coughs> software costs. Again, it is time for us to reimagine STAT, and this budget does that. This budget will also provide for instructional materials and resources. Some may say, well, since you've gone one-to-one, -one, why do you need textbooks? Well, not all of our learners learn in the same way. And some of our learners prefer and need uh, textbook supplies and materials as well. And we have to keep in mind that with 114,000 students, we have 114,000 different needs. And so we want to be able to address each of those needs, both in print and in digital, with our print and digital resources as well. I'd like to spend some time to talk about our growth and infrastructure. Uh, we've had strong en enrollment growth. It has continued through this school year. And again, and now we have uh, almost 114,000 students. We have an additional 838 students who have enrolled since September 30th. That's a large elementary school or an average size so it's a small middle school since September 30th. That's a good problem to have. I've always said that means that people are still choosing and continue to choose and trust Baltimore County Public Schools. And I'm proud of that fact. And so we, we again, we just have to adjust for that growing population. BCPS expects continued growth in its student population, projecting over 6,700 additional students by 2029. As for growth in infrastructure, it is important to keep in mind a few critical components. Number one, all collective bargaining agreements end at the end of this school year and must be renegotiated. The FY20 proposed budget includes funds to cover potential steps and cost of living increases and a possible 15-minute extension of the school day, but all of which must be negotiated. And number two, compensation comprises the majority of our growth in infrastructure expenses. And that is here, as you can see that on the chart here. So this proposal adds teaching positions to support enrollment growth, new school startup costs for the new uh, Northeast Area Ridge Road site, elementary school Ridge Road site. It will also help to reduce class sizes at the high school level. And it will round out our system principals in small schools. Many of you who uh, know the history know that last year I reduced the central office budget in order to provide assistant principal support at schools that didn't have any. So we, um, we shrunk central office and we provided those uh, assistant principals in our small elementary schools that didn't have them, but they have half time support. This, this budget proposal <coughs> asks to round out that support to full time assistant principals in those small schools as well. And this budget also accounts for $2 million that will be for the new watershed charter school that we must appropriate for. So when it comes to people for our people, just like the instructional area, we need to support operations to keep our schools running smoothly. This proposal also includes custodial and maintenance support, a 10-year capital planning study, again, so that we can think about our uh, capital improvements and can take the mystery out of those projects and so that we can prioritize those projects. We can have a, an, an external party uh, provide feedback on that so that we can prioritize our capital projects. This is also an investment in school-based AV equipment, technology infrastructure and maintenance, purchasing and pay payroll support, and a specialist in student data as we are a data-rich uh, school system. I'd also like to take some time to speak to transportation. This budget also addresses the area of transportation. We have taken several measures to improve our performance around tra transportation, including the use of innovative technology, such as electronic routing and automated vehicle location. It has enabled the development of internal dashboards to track critical performance measures of interest to our communities. 
the introduction of BCPS Serve and voice over IP telephone systems during this school year have enhanced communications and customer service uh, response capabilities. The three-year realignment program provided all bus facilities with a customer service agent to further increase stakeholder cu customer service. So the volume of students with special needs continues to grow, which requires BCPS transportation as well. This budget proposal includes an increased number of school bus attendants um, in the FY20 budget to address this growth and uh, student behavior as well. And what I mean by that is we are looking at increasing by 25 bus attendants, five bus attendants per region, geographic region, so who can be assigned to those bus routes with the most problematic behaviors and so that we can address discipline uh, head on and student behavior to, um, head on and not leave that to our bus drivers to handle alone. And it can be also a liaison between our bus drivers and our school administrators as well. And so we see that as a critical transportation uh, request for us. We are also looking in this request to increase our contracted bus routes so that we can um, relieve overcrowding on some of our buses and, and look at um, and expanding our routes as well. If we have more routes, that will help us with um, some of our overcrowding concerns. I've spoken about the bus attendance. This, we will require more routing assistance. If we are increasing the routes, of course, we'll need more routing assistance. Um, and we're looking at substitute driver and, a, and an attendant rate increase. We've heard directly from our bus drivers and our attendants, uh, substitute drivers especially, about the rate of pay. Um, we will also add two-way radios for buses. I believe that we've had some conversation as a board um, with the board about that previously. We will include transportation maintenance support as well as parent reimbursement. We're looking at the, when talking about climate and safety, you, many of you know, and I've been uh, very clear about this, that absolutely we are in the business of academics, but that doesn't matter if we don't emphasize school be behavior and discipline and making sure that we have safe and orderly learning environments for each of our students. No one sends their kid to school to be hit, kicked, or harassed or bullied in any way. And so we want to make sure that we are continuing our investments when it comes to student behavior and school climate overall. So school climate, again, is how students feel in school, and we want all of our students to feel safe. This budget allows for that in terms of school climate, behavior, and discipline. Um, we, this budget adds school counselors, 18 FTEs. It looks at the additional uh, school social workers um, by seven and a half additional school social workers. We're looking at a mentoring program. Um, consulting teachers are needed uh, due to the increase in our new teachers um, hired and additional um, psychologists as well. We're also looking at additional security patrol officers. Um, increased staffing within the building security unit to support additional building coverage on the third shift um, during the week. We're looking at additional health support, athletic trainers, building security upgrades, and school climate training and support. And that is specific to our school resource officer training and our safe schools uh, conference, which is critical to making sure that we're all on the same page. So in terms of the operating budget overall um, for the county portion, the proposed budget represents a funding of 11.2% above maintenance of effort level. At the state, the overall state general fund res re revenues are expected to increase by $24.3 million. In terms of the special revenue fund, the two largest grants the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and Title I make up 63.4% of the total. And in FY18, BCPS was awarded a five-year, $15 million magnet school assistance um, program grant. 
In terms of capital projects fund, the capital spending increase of $462 million is due um, to county bonding to the county bonding cycle and the bond issuance approved by voters in November. And for the enterprise fund, the enterprise fund is used to account for all financial activities of the food services program. So the overall, just as an overall picture of this budget proposal, Special Education and ESOL make up $5.3 million, or 4.4% of the budget. Literacy and Mathematics make up $4.8 million, or 4% of the budget. Growth and Infrastructure, again, many, much of that has to do with steps and cost of living increases, additional benefits, and the 15-minute uh, day initiative. That makes up $103.7 million, which is 84.9% of this budget request. Transportation makes up $2.3 million, which is 1.8% of the budget. And school climate and safety, $6.1 million, which is 4.9% of the overall budget. So now that you've heard my budget proposal for the FY20 uh, school year, um, this is the calendar of events. This is where I started in the beginning of the presentation that I'd like to circle back to. Um, we will have a, a board, uh, the board will have, I should say, the, a public hearing um, right here in this building uh, next week on January 15th at 6.30. Uh, the snow date, hopefully we won't be dealing with snow, but the snow date for the public hearing will be the very next day if we need it on January 16th. Uh, the Board of Education work session will be held here on January 22nd, and the snow date for the work session will be January 23rd, and the board uh, is set again on the schedule. It's anticipated to adopt the budget on February 5th. And again, we will work with the board officers to arrange two by two sessions so that we can take a deep dive into the budget together. And um, Chairwoman Causey, that is my budget proposal for FY20. I wanted to thank you for that, and I wanted to just uh, say that we are going to get together and present to the board. We'll email you what uh, opportunities you have to meet two by two or two by three with staff, also how we're going to submit questions, um, and also the specifics of the public hearing, um, <clears throat> and we're looking forward to that. Um, we are running a little bit ahead of schedule, so if we had time for just one question just quick in, or comment about the budget from the members. Ms. Rowe. I really, I mean, obviously there's a whole book here to go through, but not my initial response to this budget is, this is wonderful. And this is, I've heard public speaker after public speaker for years say we need this, we need that, we need this other thing, let's have ideas. I've watched people blow up social media and I can't honestly say in all that time that I've seen a budget this responsive to the things that the community is saying that they want reflected in an operating budget. So I'm sure as I go through the book I'm going to have questions, but the goals of the budget as you've outlined are very impressive, thank you. Uh, Ms. Pasteur. I want to ditto what um, Ms. Rowe just said, but first I have to give you credit for having read all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and us for still being able to sit up. Um, we're ahead of schedule, Ms. Pastor. So I can tell much. you right now, we're ahead of schedule, so okay. we're doing great. But so much of what we have heard from speakers, and um, particularly tonight from, from Sharon and um, from, from teachers um, who really dug uh, deeply just into their passion about what is missing. A number of the people spoke about the West Side. But, uh, and having been, 
an administrator on the west side and being able to ditto so much of what I heard tonight. And when I listened to money being moved around for more attention to special education, for um, more attention to those, those core courses, and not just looking at those schools that have been blue ribbon schools, but understanding that we had a small pot, for real, when you take a look at the number, it's an impressive number, but we have ever so many more schools out here that are not. And looking at a budget that seems to be paying attention, and I know it seems, um, um, daunting when we think about, and I have to speak to the moving of the, the math contract, but I'm still, I'm feeling good. I mean, I have to admit, I was crying while they were doing their thing, and when the marshmallow person didn't do marshmallows tonight, <laughs> but really spoke to the heart of education and excellence along with the other people. Um, this is just academically and instructionally responsible, and then it means that it is our job to, as, as uh, Ms. Rose said, to take a look at, at all of the places where we have questions, but as a school board, to be responsible in terms of supporting, for real support, to um, the staff, and not just the staff on this level, but the staff, the staffing in our schools. And I see in here, even though you weren't really saying this, that it also means being more responsible about who we put in our schools in terms of administrators and teachers and hiring those people and meeting um, um, the state when they can, they can very easily legislate how we're supposed to act and what we're supposed to do with our children, particularly those who have been disruptive. It's easy to sit in Annapolis or wherever and come up with those laws. But I'm seeing now in this um, counselors and psychologists and all of those folks who will bring the emotional accoutrements, if you will, that will support our teachers. Um, so I'm, I'm anxious. Wasn't real anxious before, but I know that's Ms. Rose's thing, Mr. <laughs> Kuntz's thing, to jump into those numbers and, um, and Ms. Mack to jump into those numbers. I want to jump into a school. But now <laughs> I am ready to jump into these numbers and look at this. I know this is a long piece, but it's been a long time coming. Lord knows it's been a long time coming. Thank you. Okay, so now we're not ahead anymore, but. Okay. <laughs> and I don't care. Thank you for that. No, that's it's wonderful. It's my turn tonight. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful. Uh, so just quickly, any other comments or questions? And we will have, as Ms. White said, additional opportunities. Um, I do want to say also that I am encouraged uh, with many of these adjustments to the budget. It seems like a great starting point for addressing the concerns that have been brought to the board by the stakeholders, as Ms. Rowe pointed out. Uh, for many years as she was one of those stakeholders um, and community members and also um, <clears throat> elected members of our community that came forward. Um, I'm just wondering how many principals are up right now going online to the budget to see what they're going to have in their schoolhouse budgets um, for the coming year. And I think that is an important piece because as we heard here tonight from educators, that uh, it is folks in their schoolhouse, in their communities, uh, that can many times best identify the resources they need to support their <coughs> students. I'm encouraged uh, by a modified technology plan uh, that does not absorb resources as it has in the past for many areas of the system. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the issues of addressing the academic achievement and improving that for our students. So again, thank you, and we will um, be hearing much more about that in the time to come. So we are gonna move on now to our next work session, which is agenda item P, 
report on the proposed fiscal year 2020 county capital budget. And for that, we get to see Mr. Kevin Smith and Mr. Pete Dixit. So as the board knows, we've been addressing this issue for some time, and I'm going to ask Mr. Uh, Smith to open with his remarks and Mr. Dixit, and then we'll have time for uh, hearing answers that were prepared in advance, and then also additional time for questions from board members. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Also, I want to thank each of you who sent questions and the calls and conversations that we had. I hope it was helpful and beneficial to you as you go through this process. Um, you've got a ton of documents that you've received with a lot of information, and I'm, I'm glad to see that you are absorbing that and you're asking really good questions about how the Capital uh, um, State Submission and the Capital Commission uh, state submission and capital and county capital <laughs> submission is presented. Um, tonight I'm joined with Mr. Dixit, as you were indicated before, we've, we provided the questions, the responses to the questions that we received. However, that is just a smittering of all of the conversations and questions that you guys had by phone calls and interactions with the superintendent, Mr. Dixit, myself, and other members of the team. I hope it was beneficial as you go through your deliberation. Um, we have, I'll just state that the FY20 capital, um, county capital plan is about 75% underway as it relates for funding from the state. So we're pretty forward down the road and we're excited about that. Um, as we look at putting together the FY20 capital plan and those components will go for that, you'll see some of these projects flow through to that. We're excited about that. We're excited where we are. I hope that these questions and the conversations has, have yielded to you what you needed in order to make an informed decision for your um, constituents as we move forward to serve and support our more than 114,000 students. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Dixit who has some comments, and at that point in time, we'll take any additional questions you may have. Thank you and good evening. Uh, Chair Ms. Causey, Vice Chair Ms. Han, Superintendent White, and members of the board. In the last meeting, I shared with you the county capital program I'm just going to recap some of the items that I mentioned last time to refresh your memory. Um, but before I go into that, the board had asked for a binder, a submission to the state uh, uh, capital improvement program. And it is my understanding that all of you have received a copy of it. Okay. <laughs> Great. Uh, this is a county capital budget request which really supports the state budget request that board had approved earlier. There are two funding sources. One is the state and the other one is county. Unfortunately, the board does not have any authority to add funding to those, two, uh, to, to those sources. Uh, the school board's approval is required. Even though you don't have the funding authority, you, uh, your approval is required before we can submit any of the plan. Uh, I again want to say that, that our available resources, uh, our needs far exceed the available resources. So there are too many issues out there that we would like to take care of it, but it's just the funding is not there. Just to give you some idea, from the past trend, 70 to $75 million have been provided by county, and 40 to $45 million per year have been provided by the state. So what we are talking about, a total of 100 to $120 million per year to meet the needs, which is in billions. So that's the, just to give you some idea of, uh, of the proportion of needs and available funding. The, it is important that we send the message to our uh, funding partners in one voice. So we are all part of the same team. And the stronger our voice is, the higher the probability that more and more projects that we have submitted will be approved. Our, our, our needs, our submission is guided by uh, additional seats, aging infrastructure, and the discussions that you hear here in this meeting that superintendent has with several community stakeholders 
And all of that is reflected in our submission. So that's the capital program. Uh, all of the questions that we received, we have provided the responses. If you want, I can quickly go over the questions, but I believe you already have the answers. And also, most of the questions were answered in the detailed submission that you received a copy of. The only question that I recall was about the site for two Northeast area school. And um, uh, it is not, the state has not rejected or denied any project. The issue on the site is that both of these are board-owned sites, and they did not require any board approval in the past. But the state has asked that boards approve these sites, even though board owns these sites. And we are going to bring it to your approval, for your approval in the near future. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so that's about all, and at this time we'll request your approval of the capital program. Ms. Rowe. So um, one of the things I noticed on here is that uh, items 41 through 47 are um, bulk allocations that are not specific to a project. Can you, I know we had an earlier conversation about that. Can, can you expound on that and include the information you gave me earlier for the sake of the full board? Okay, uh, these, are th these are the funds that county provides us for major maintenance items. So these categories, if you look at it, that these are fuel tank replacement or ADA updates. We already have potential projects that we are aware of. They are not listed here, but we already have a running list of projects in that area. And these are extremely critical to us because there, there is no other funding source for example, for ADA updates or for tank replacements or for major maintenance. So if there's any, any emergency in boilers or chillers that is not covered here, the only source of funding are these funds. So my concern about this is that according to the county code, a project is a unit of allocation. And I'm concerned that if the board passes this budget, the way that it reads right now, with these categories that are not allocated to specific projects, that we could be in a potential situation where we've passed this budget and then later on the county executive or someone in county government decides to move money out of that and because it's not attached to a specific project, it's not legally binding to stay there once this budget is passed by all civic parties. And so what I would like to know is if you have the ability um, to attach to this budget, not just the line item for these, but either a very detailed description of what that money could be used for or a list of potential projects that you anticipate. Because I want to make sure that if we pass this budget the way that it reads, that that money it goes for where it's intended to go. So if it's money that you need that you can't attach to a specific project because you don't know exactly what project, at least attach some kind of a list that either lists schools and projects you're aware of might come up or very detailed descriptions about what that money should be used for. Because right now, I mean, just looking at major maintenance, I would have thought maintenance would be in the operating budget. So I'd like to see um, detailed information on 41 through 47. We can work with but the superintendent and yeah, provide that information, we, we absolutely. And, and the second part to your question is, in the past, money has not been taken out of these allocations. If anything, it has been added, added to. So th this, is, this is critical area of funding, and major maintenance really is a misnomer. It is the capital, if a bowler is replaced, it is really not major maintenance, it is a replacement, it's a capital. So it's major maintenance within the capital category. But that's the kind of detail that I think if it were in a document attached to this would safeguard that money. Yeah. Because so maybe nothing's happened in the past, but people get ideas. We'll work with the superintendent and provide that information. 
Thank you, Ms. Rowe, and thank you, Mr. Smith, for that. And just to Ms. Rowe's point, one line item is 18 million, another line item is 10 million. So when we're talking about <clears throat> capital construction, some of us think, ooh, that's an elementary school. <laughs> that's an addition to Pleasant Plains. Um, so uh, to Ms. Rowe's point, it would be helpful. So I appreciate you working with the interim superintendent on and that. Just Bear in mind, and we will do that, just bear in mind, all of the projects that are listed one through 40 are projects, but we already have an infrastructure that we have to maintain and keep up because we have a deferred maintenance situation that we have to address. That's what these projects, but uh, to your point, we'll get the, you want the, the proposed documents or whatever, and we'll work through the superintendent to provide that. Okay, thank you. Other board members with questions or comments at this time? Okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. We still need the approval. This next one. So here we are at the next portion of the board meeting, which is item Q, board member comments. And what we're going to do is start at one side of the room and then go around. Um, <coughs> For board member comments and Ms. Rowe we can start with you so my comments are directed at the staff of the school system the superintendent staff and I want to say that I'm very happy with the level of cooperation that we're getting on the capital budget I understand that we asked for a whole bunch of additional documentation right before the holidays and I think that it's been very good because it means that we don't have to sit up here till three in the morning with me asking you every question. Um, and I'm really happy with what the operating budget looks like. And I think that th it reflects a responsiveness to the public that's, that's very impressive. And I look forward to reading this document. Mr. Q? Um, I'm not as enthusiastic as Mrs. Rowe is about reading large budget documents, but I, I do appreciate all the time and effort that it took to put all this together. Um, and I just want to reiterate that, you know, we all have the goal of, of creating the best results that we can for the children involved in the system, which is now 114 plus thousand. It just seems to continue to increase every day. So um, there's a tremendous magnitude um, uh, regarding what we do uh, with an impact that's going to be felt for generations and and we we need to all remember that as we move forward and I and appreciate all the work that everyone does here and uh, and you know our constituents are are re reaching out to us constantly so there are a lot of um, a lot of issues that we'll be bringing up over the course and we want to be um, responsible and reactive to those folks but we also want to maintain focus on on the game as we move forward so um, you know thank you all for for all the work that you do and uh, I yield my time <laughs> Miss Pasture again I, I want to um, thank you and I do uh, want to thank the staff and truly let your heart not be troubled. The curriculum committee has your back because it's going to happen because the backs we have first and foremost are the backs of those children. And so we're going to make it all happen because we have to make it happen for them. And there's a period, exclamation mark, amen, after that. Mr. Hayden. Uh, to the superintendent uh, and staff, it's a heck of a job, and thank you very much for all that you did, uh, and we appreciate that. That's not to say that there might not be some really tough questions as we go down a pike, but uh, it, it's very, very impressive. So thank you very much, and, and my gift to you is I'm quiet now. We'll move on. <laughs> Ms. Adekoya. I love my job. I literally love what I do when I encounter students, when I visit schools, when I spare hair chat cafe. I love 
meeting with students, hearing their concerns, and being able to advocate on the behalf of especially those that have no voice. And I vow to always continue to uphold my position to the highest standard possible to the students. Ms. Hen. No comment. Thank you, Ms. Fozzie. Ms. Jones. As somebody who works for capital infrastructure planning every day, I have to say my first view of your capital infrastructure report was it's a pretty good report. But that said, I am going to review it, and I may have additional questions. Um, I also have been working with Mr. Kevin Smith and Mr. Dixit and the other staff um, on the special projects for lead in the school water. Uh, as an engineer, that's something that I hold really close to public safety. And you guys have been very cooperative. And I, I should also add to the rest of the board that um, they are on the ball. <laughs> and they are following protocol. So I'm going to work with them additionally to bring forward a report to the school board. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian. I want to make three brief comments. Uh, on Tuesday, December 18th, Ms. White invited myself uh, to Spares Point Middle Senior High School. We were met there by the principals of those two schools. Uh, we were greeted by Christmas carolers. We walked through those school buildings. Uh, we visited numerous classes. We actually toured the library, the auditorium, the cafeteria, the gym, and the boys. I, I visited the boys' locker room. Uh, <laughs> and those were common areas that are used by both the high school and the middle school. And out of the entire Baltimore County pop school population, those are the only two schools that are housed in the same building. The middle school students are upstairs. The high school students are downstairs. There's a total of 625 upstairs, 975, we were told, downstairs. So there's 1,600 kids in that building. That's going to become a hot topic at some point in the near future, I think. Uh, the second thing, I hope my learning curve is relatively short. So please be patient with me as I try to learn as much as I can as quickly as I can. And then lastly, you know, I joke with Mr. Hayden about attending Essex elementary school for three years. However, I spent over 20 years on those fields playing and coaching. And I honestly don't think that I would be sitting here right now if it wasn't for that 20 years on that playground. Thank you. Ms. Mack. Um, earlier, um, Ms. Causey mentioned, uh, I think she reminded everybody that this board has only really been in effect for a little bit over a month. I've had some very demanding jobs in my life, um, mainly with the phone company, but I don't know if I've ever had a month like the last month. Having said that, I would like to say that I continue to be very, very impressed with the people on the board, the people on staff, Ms. White. Um, I think we all have the same goal, and that is the students. And to that end, I know Ms. Pasteur will be happy to know that I have confirmed some dates to visit the schools on the west side in the month of January. Thank you. Ms. Scott. Thank you so much. Um, I'd say today is uh, very encouraging. Um, I was encouraged with this uh, proposed budget. I think it's well put together. I think that it addresses a lot of the issues that I feel can benefit the schools in my community, the Northwest community, um, in the operating budget. I think it addresses um, some of the um, support <laughs> staff, some of the issues that are inside of the classrooms that need to be addressed, and also it gives resources to teachers. So that's very encouraging. I look forward to reading it. I'm also encouraged by the amount of support from the BCPS community for supporting our student member Halima, who is also from the Northwest District, which is my district, and I think she represents um, the student population very well. And so I just want, I wanted her to know that, um, that she is um, an example and inspiration for young girls like my daughter who are coming up, who look to you as a role model. So thank you for that. And Mr. Offerman. Uh, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Towson High School, which is my work alma mater, uh, with uh, Mrs. White uh, last uh, uh, this uh, this uh, Monday, and uh, you know it was great to go back to the school. And I'm just impressed by by how hard school staff, and I mean overall school staff, cafeteria workers, bus drivers work, and the same with the the staff, the, the central office staff. Obviously, what we saw today, the budget report, and the other reports we're getting. I mean, they're thorough and. You know they're they're willing to answer questions and uh, you know I'm, I'm it, it, it's a really nice positive working environment now and I, I certainly hope that uh, I look forward to a lot of success over the next couple of years. 
Thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to uh, agenda item R, information. We have uh, in our binders the revise and on board docs, the revised superintendent's rule 4302, dealing with personnel, teachers, awarding and maintaining tenure. So I invite folks to take a look at that. And then the last item for our board meeting tonight is item S, announcements. And I do want to announce that we are going to have a board public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget this coming Tuesday, January 15th, 2019 at Greenwood. And it begins at 7 p.m. There's also a snow date on January 16th, uh, um, <clears throat> the day after. But hopefully we won't have any snow. Um, we also have recognition of Martin Luther King's birthday and schools and offices will be closed on Monday, January 21st. And our next board meeting is Tuesday, January 22nd at 6.30 p.m. right here. And I do just want to say that I am so really grateful to the board. I know it's been one short month and I know it's been uh, a lot of work, a lot that's going on. Um, and we did even have a winter break, but it didn't really feel like it did it. But that's okay. And I am very grateful to the <coughs> superintendent and the staff for all of their work on the budget book um, and look forward to the plans that we're gonna make and the processes we're gonna put in place for board members to engage with it. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.